if there's one thing we know, it's that Jesus is real. We are a family of faith fully engaged. Jesus is on mission to use ordinary people like us to do extraordinary things. By simply responding to Jesus, he uses us to change lives and love people the way he does. Because Jesus is real. In the book of Proverbs, in the King James translation, it says, in effect, that without a vision, my people perish. God has a vision for our lives. And today we begin a brand new series. It's actually my very first series as lead pastor. About four months ago, as we started planning this year, 2013, knowing that Pastor Bill and I were going to finish up the leadership transition, um, we began to talk about mission and vision, who we are, where we've been, and what we're becoming. And so we sat in this meeting, and, and what's beautiful is, is it's not like we need a brand new thing that we're doing. Crossroads is a great church. You know why Crossroads is a great church? Because you guys are great. Church isn't a building. Church is people. Church is people. But we started talking about how do we want to express who we are? And so what we began to do is we began to talk as a staff about who we are, what we're doing, where we see ourselves going. And in regards to that, we came up with a new mission statement, a new vision, a new set of core values. They're really not new. This is actually who we've always been. And as I start talking, I'm like, yeah, this is who Crossroads has always been. It's just a restatement of them. It's a new way to say who we are. And it's also a, a lens through which we're going to view all that we are. So we're starting this new series today called Jesus is Real, We Respond. So for our new mission statement, it's going to pop up on the screen for you. There it is. Simply responding to Jesus. Go ahead, say it. Say, simply responding to Jesus. Now, say it like you're excited about it. Simply responding to Jesus. Now, you know why I love this mission statement? Because it's actually the easiest way to express what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Not just as a church, but us as individuals. In every single area, in every single moment of our lives... As a Christian, God simply asks us to simply respond to Jesus. So if you're married and your spouse does something that is incredibly annoying for the 90,000th time, and I know none of you who are married have ever experienced anything like that. Instead of just getting angry with them, what should you do? Simply respond to Jesus. And Jesus says, don't get angry with them. It hasn't worked the other million times. So I'm just going to love you. And I'm going to say, hey, that really kind of bothered me, but I do love you. See, the Christian life is really about simply responding to Jesus. It makes me think of John, or excuse me, Peter in John's Gospel, chapter 21. Remember that Jesus made breakfast by the sea? And, and Peter had forsaken Jesus. And, and he comes, he realized Jesus is on the shore. And Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah, Lord, I do. And he's like, well, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend to my lamb. See, that question, do you love me? There it is. That's the question that Jesus asked me and you every single day of our lives. Every single moment, do you love me? And if you love me, then we respond to Jesus by living differently in the world. And as a church, Crossroads has always simply responded to Jesus. I think of Pastor Bill some 37 years ago, feeling that Clark County needed a church like Crossroads long before there was lots of churches here. And he simply responded to Jesus. He planted a church along the way. Some of the leadership here was concerned about what was going on and the way kids were being educated. They said, man, we really need to see kids get educated, grow academically and grow in Christ. And boom, they simply responded to Jesus and they started Cornerstone Christian School. Along the way, they were looking at what was going on in, in our culture. And they were saying, man, we need to get more involved in 
with pregnancy centers to give people an option instead of just going and, and having an abortion. And out of this church, I think there's been three local pregnancy centers that have been started right here, Crossroads. Our ministry has always been founded on a simple reality that we're just going to simply respond to Jesus. And I love it because not only is this our church's mission statement, this is my personal life mission statement. Can I live a life that I just simply respond to Jesus? When somebody is hurt, I simply respond by hugging them and praying for them, trying to help them. When I see somebody in need or if some disaster happens across the globe, we simply respond to Jesus and we be the hands and feet of Christ. What's funny is that you hear about simply responding to Jesus, and we've talked about that a lot, right? You hear that phrase here a lot. It's nothing new. It's nothing novel. But I just think it's good, old-fashioned, what it means to be a Christian. So this is our new mission statement. We're going to be talking about this. And everything we do, you're going to say, man, I wonder why we're doing that. And you're going to say to yourself, hey, I think we're simply responding to Jesus. And you'll have the answer right on. Can all of us live our lives simply responding to Jesus. Now, that's the mission. The vision, of course, we have a brand new one. It's coming up on the screens for you. Because Jesus is real, we are a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. You guys want to say it together with me? Here we go. Because Jesus is real, we are a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. Now, you guys did that with so much gusto, we don't even need to say it again. You did a good job. Really good. Now, I'm going to spend the next seven weeks breaking this open for us, laying the foundation for the future. So starting today and next week, I'm going to take that first phrase, because Jesus is real. And then we're going to spend a week looking at because we are a family of faith. For those of you who are around here a lot, you know we talk about that a lot because we're a family. Jesus is at the center. And we're a family where we're fully engaged. There's no levels of being a Christian. We're all called to serve the Lord together. Not one ministry is more important than the other. If you go on to our, our new website that just launched, if you notice our staff page, it's just a big series of pictures, all different people there. No particular order. Why? Because we're all just doing what God's called us to do. Together. But everyone's called to be engaged. It's not like, well, listen, that guy's supposed to be engaged because he's young, or this guy's supposed to be engaged because he's wealthy, or this gal's supposed to be engaged because she's gifted. No, we're all engaged. Full engagement. Everyone involved in what God is doing because we're a body. And then we're transforming our community and our world. I'll take two weeks on how God is transforming us and how, because God is transforming us, We're out busy changing the world. Transformation. So this is our new vision, and we're going to be seeing a lot of it. Now, I want to really give a shout out to Pastor Bill, because our vision statement, because Jesus is real, we put that at the top, because for those of you who are in Next Step, and if you haven't been, tonight's the night for you. For those of you in the second half, Pastor Bill's always like, man, Daniel, we got to remember, we got to keep the why. The why needs to be right there. Start with the why. For those of you in Next Step, you know what I'm talking about. We put the why of our vision right up at the top. Why do we do what we do? Because Jesus is real. Because Jesus is real. That's the why. I was asked in, in a meeting, Pastor Daniel, if you had to preach one sermon, if you knew you only had one more sermon, God was going to give you one more chance to address the body, what would you talk about? And that's what I said. I said, because Jesus is real. Because he is real. And Jesus is at street level with all of us. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what's gone on in your life, no matter how good or bad it's been, Jesus is right there at street level with each one of us. In the midst of great victories and horrific defeats, problems, Jesus is right there. No matter if you've been walking with the Lord for 50 years or if you're just coming down off of a bender last night, Jesus is right there. He's real. And so we took that reality, that why, and we put it right up at the front because Jesus is real. How many times? I mean, those of you who come here, you've heard me say that a million times, right? Because he's real. He's real. And he really is real. So we took that why, why we do what we do, why we are we are. We put it right up at the front because Jesus is real. And everything 
flows out of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the next two weeks and we're going to explore because Jesus is real. Really, we're going to spend the rest of our lives exploring the reality of Jesus and all the different ways he's real. But for this series, we're going to take two weeks. Now, the key for us is that we need to find the sweet spot. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. We need to find the sweet spot. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. Now, I'm going to spend this week looking on the reality that Jesus is fully God. And then next week, we'll spend some more time looking at Jesus is fully man. But we need to find the sweet spot. Why? Because when you say Jesus is fully God and fully man, there's a tension there. Because how can he be fully man if he's fully God? And how can he be fully God if he's fully man? And one of the earliest heresies that the church dealt with was what they called the Arian controversy because people struggle with the reality that Jesus was fully God. That's, it plays itself out in, its, in the present day, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They want to say Jesus isn't God. How can he be fully man and fully God? Because well, they haven't found the sweet spot. When the sweet spot is two things that seemingly are in tension that are actually reconciled together because God has pushed them together. So we need to find the sweet spot. And if you look at your own life, a lot of us, and I'm included in this, we struggle to find that sweet spot. Because if your focus is on Jesus being fully God at the expense of him being fully man, you say, I worship Jesus, but I really can't live a life like him because he's God and I'm not. See that? Because he is God, we do worship him. But when you say, I can't live a life like him because he's God and I'm not, you lost the sweet spot. Because Jesus said, you'll do even greater things than I've done. I didn't say that, Jesus said that. So on one side, people want to focus on the divinity of Jesus at the expense of his humanity, or on the other side, very prevalent today, where people say, well, the humanity of Jesus. Jesus is a perfect example of how we should live. But we really don't want to worship him too much because he's a human. See, they lost the sweet spot. So we need to find, and I realize that in all of our lives on any given day, depending on which day, we lean to one side or the other. But the Bible doesn't ask us to lean. The Bible asks us to hold these two things at the same time. He is fully God and he is worthy of worship because God has made him such. And on the other side, he's the perfect example of how to live our lives. So we want to find that sweet spot. Now, we're going to spend our time this morning in Philippians chapter 2. But before you turn there, I want you to open up your Bibles to John's Gospel chapter 1. We're going to start in John's Gospel. So if you're new to the Bible, the New Testament begins about two-thirds of the way through. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the fourth Gospel is John. John chapter 1. I'm going to read the first five verses and I'm going to skip down to verse 14. John's gospel begins this way. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. And if you skip over to verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now you see that John's gospel begins... In the beginning was the word. That was a Greek philosophical term. It was the word logos. In the beginning was this word. And this word was with God. And the word was God. Wow. And then you get to verse 14. And the word became flesh. That's the word incarnation. The word who is God took on flesh and dwelt among us. Who are they speaking about? Jesus. See, John's gospel, it's clear. It's clear that these Jewish men, who for them it would be a huge stretch to say that a human being was God, they're right there. Right there. This word who was in the beginning with God, who was God, 
In him is life, and that life is the light of men. This, this word, who, this light, who the darkness could comp- cannot comprehend, became flesh and dwelt among us, and they beheld his glory. Powerful. Jesus is God. Now, go to the right a little bit. Go to John chapter 14. And what's beautiful, if you're in John chapter 1, just about 13 chapters, John 14, right there. It's glorious. Listen to verse 6 of John chapter 14. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father. See, this is why a good church will make a big deal about Jesus. Because notice what Jesus says, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you hear what he's saying. Jesus doesn't say, I am a way. I am a truth or I am a life. As if there's a million roads and a million ways and a million truths. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me and the next thing and the next thing. And no, no one comes to the Father except what? Through me. Now, I realize that runs roughshod over 21st century Western culture, roughshod over it, where everyone wants to say, well, that's your truth. That Jesus thing, that's your way. You know, if you want that spirit-filled life, that's your gig, not mine. Brothers and sisters, listen. You may not want this to be true, but your like or dislike of it doesn't change its truthfulness. And listen, I know it's a tough pill to swallow. I didn't grow up in the church, so believe me. I remember the first time I started reading the things that Jesus said. I'm like, man, I don't like this guy. I mean, where's the wiggle room? Because, you know, we all like a little wiggle room, right? It's like, if I get a little, you know, wiggle, wiggle. That's right, I just wiggled. Those are the people that sound like, what do you do? They're laughing. I'm wiggling. We all want a little wiggle room, but Jesus doesn't give it. Because I may not like, I may not say, hey, I don't believe in gravity. I'm not really into it. Not my thing. I'd rather just kind of float off into space. Little space cadet on my own terms. I may say, I don't believe in gravity. I mean, gravity's your truth, not mine. You're just limited by your own understanding. Believing in that myth, gravity. But if I walk off the roof of a 20-story building, I may not believe in gravity, but gravity is gravity. And I'm going to go... You splat. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the way. And that's why Christians have always believed, even when people don't like it, that there's only one way. Because if there was more than one way, Jesus would never have had to die in that garden of Gethsemane when he prayed. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass me, but not my will, yours be done. And less than 24 hours later, he's on that cross. If there was any other way, he would never have had to go. Not only is Jesus the way, but he's the truth. Not a truth, not old school truth, new school truth. He is the truth. And he is the life. What that means is that for you and I, the life that God created you for is only found in Christ, in Jesus. The only place it's found. You can try, you can live a self-styled life and it will have this... The, the, the trimmings of life, but it's not abundant life, eternal life. It's not the life that you were created for. It pales in comparison to the life that God has for you in Christ. It's amazing what Jesus says next because he's like, look, 
You've seen my father. And Philip's like, Lord, show us the father. Come on, bro. And Jesus says, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Do you realize that? See, Jesus is God and we respond to him as God because those of us who've seen Jesus, we've seen the father as well. We often say Jesus is God-like, but do you realize that God is Jesus-like? He is. God is Jesus-like. Jesus was the perfect example of what God living on earth looks like. And that's why we love studying his life. We love seeing who he is and what he has done. So this is why we find that sweet spot that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Now, turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to take verses 5 to 11. We're going to take it pretty quickly. But I think this is one of the most condensed and profound statements of who Jesus is that you can find in your entire Bible. It's often been said that the Apostle Paul took an early hymn or an early uh, catechesis phrase, which means instruction, and he added it into this epistle because it's so compact and each phrase is so powerful. Look at what it says, Philippians. And now if you don't know where Philippians is, if you're in John, just keep going to your right. You'll hit Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and then Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. And if you don't, if you want to learn the Bible, we can teach you a little song that we, I didn't learn it in kids' church because I never went to those things, or if I did, they threw me out. But some of you learn those songs. You can find everything in the Bible. That's right, I did say I got thrown out of kids' church. That's right. You're like, I can't imagine it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, Paul begins by saying to the church of Philippi, I want this mind to be in you, which was also in Jesus. And if you read the first four verses of this chapter, Paul is exhorting the church in Philippi to think the way Jesus thought, to serve one another, to esteem each other higher than themselves, to be unified. And I love that because Paul could have written that to any church in the world, that if we're going to be Christians, then we should be like Jesus. I mean, isn't that what it means? Being a Christian means one who is like Christ. And so in each one of our lives, as we respond to Jesus, we're saying, I want to be like Jesus. And when we're like Jesus, we're not selfish. We're not judgmental. We're not just arguing. We're not just, it's all about me, because Jesus didn't live that way. You know, I know for a lot of, some of you in here today, maybe it's the first time you've come to church, because along the way, someone who was a Christian didn't act much like Jesus. And to be honest with you, from all of us here, we apologize on their behalf. But you know what you have to remember if you're in here and, and you've had that experience? Don't let the followers of Jesus keep you from the main attraction. Because the very gospel that a Christian believes is actually that the reason Jesus died is because we can't do it. That we all fall short. I'm one of the pastors here. I fall short on a daily basis. I don't live out the fullness of who Jesus is in every single way, in every single motivation. And that's why I believe in him in the first place. Because I realize I can't get it done. But we should be growing to be more like him on a daily basis. Responding to people the way Jesus would. Loving people the way Jesus would. Being selfless the way Jesus is. But we're all growing. None of us have arrived except for Jesus himself. The rest of us, we're all in process together. And it's a growing pains happen, don't they? It's a little messy sometimes. But he starts, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And then what you have is you have four verses and you have four different things about Jesus. Look at what happens in verse six. 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Verse 6 talks about who Jesus was before he was born in a manger. We can call this pre-incarnation. Because if incarnation is when Jesus takes on skin, becomes a man, verse 6 is pre-incarnation. And it teaches us that Jesus is God's equal. Jesus is God's equal. It says being in the form of God. That word form is the Greek word morphe, which literally means an outward expression that corresponds with what's inside. So before Jesus was a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, he was in the form of God. Jesus was God. And not only that, look what it says. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Some of your translations said, did not consider this to be something that needs to be grasped. You got the idea of grasping is taking something that's not yours. It's robbery. It means the same thing. The idea here is that Jesus, before he was a baby in the manger, was not trying to get some divinity. He already had it. He didn't need to rob it. He didn't need to steal it. He didn't need to acquire it. He simply already had it. As God, Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead. He was there. He was not trying to get divinity. He already had it. Now, that's before he was a baby in the manger. Then in verse 7, of course, look at what it says. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. This is the incarnation. This is Jesus being born in a manger. And it teaches us that Jesus is a servant. Jesus is a servant. Notice, he made himself of no reputation. Some of your translation says he made himself nothing. Which means that Jesus, rather than giving up his divinity and becoming human, he added humanity to his godliness. Jesus added, so to speak, humanity to his resume. It's a powerful thing that he did that. But notice what it says but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. That word form, it's the same thing. Remember I said it, what's the form? It's an outward expression of what is inside. So Jesus was in the form of God, and then he took on the form of a bondservant. And then it says, in the likeness of men. So think about this. Jesus is God. And then in the incarnation, Jesus takes on the form of a bondservant. In the Bible, you know what a bondservant is? A bondservant is a voluntary slave. Not someone who had to be a slave. Somebody who said, I'm going to be a slave. I, I volunteer for the position. Think about that. God Almighty decided to come and be a voluntary slave for you and for me. And he came in the likeness of man. So God came in the likeness just like you and I. The incarnation, this only happens one time. Now, I don't know about you, but when you hear this, that he was in the form of God, who's always been God, becomes a man, you might be like, how is that possible? And brother, sister, I'm totally with you. It's only happened one time in humanity. It's complicated, more complicated than we'll ever fathom, but it's still true. Jesus took on the form of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of men. And then look what happens in verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 8 now speaks to us of the crucifixion. Jesus is humbly obedient at the cross. Jesus is humbly obedient at the cross. Now think about this. He's fully God. He adds humanity to his resume. He comes in the likeness of us. And then he humbles himself. And in obedience, gives up his life at the cross. Brothers and sisters, next to love, I believe the next most profound attribute of a follower of Jesus should be humility. It should be humility. Why? Because the Christian gospel says that God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. 
Not one of us, not one Christian through all the history of Christianity has gotten to heaven because they've got it together because they were deserving that they did enough good stuff to get there. All of us come absolutely needy with nothing in our hands, paupers, beggars. And anybody who comes to God as a beggar will receive God's grace in Christ. None of us bring a worthy offering to the table. And because of that, we can't take credit for our lives. We can't say, oh yes, I'm so talented. I mean, of course God uses me. Because we didn't even create the talents. The giftings were given by gift. The ability to hone that gift through discipline and and perseverance, that comes from God as well. And so the Christian message is simply that God has done for you what you could never do for yourself. And all we did was say, thank you, Lord. And because of that, there should be no pompousness. There should be no judgmentalism. There should simply be, I can't believe what God has done for me. I can't believe that I am saved. I can't believe that the Holy Spirit dwells in me and God, with his amazing ways, can use this life. Because Jesus, God became a man and humbled himself to die for us. You know, there's some of us in here today. You simply need to receive, you need to respond to this by humbling yourself and saying yes to Jesus. By simply receiving God's grace. Sure, maybe you're a good old-fashioned American and you think that you are right with God by nature of being born in the most affluent country in the world. And because you're human, heaven is yours. I call that spiritual entitlement. I believe that for a long time. I'm human, so heaven's mine. I'm invited to the party because I'm alive. No, 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 no. That's just the way Americans think. You go anywhere else in the world, no one thinks that way. It's just us. I brain Doritos. You can meditate on that. You can meditate on that. Others of us, you're trying to work your way to be right with God. You're trying, trying, trying. You have all these things. I'm a good husband. I'm a good employee. I provide really well. I have a nice extra car for when it's sunny out that I can go cruising in. I got that, so I'm good. I'm not like the really bad guys. I'm not like Charles Manson or Adolf Hitler, so I'm doing good. Self-salvation plan. We respond to Jesus by simply saying, yes, Lord. Just saying thank you to God. You know, for others of us, we've been walking with the Lord for some time. But even if you walk with the Lord for a a while, sometimes humility is really hard to come by, isn't it? Like you love the Lord and you know you're supposed to be humble, but let's just face it, you're not humble at all. You just don't, you just look down on everybody. You just think you're better than everybody and you think you're smarter than everybody. And I, I don't know why it's that way, but it's that way for a lot of us. Where you know humility ought to be who you are, but you just ain't that. Someone asked me recently, and I don't, it, it made me laugh because I don't, I mean, why would you ask me this? It's like, Pastor Daniel, how do you get humble? I'm just like, Psh. <laughs> if you find out, you let me know, you know. <laughs> like, I, I'm game for that. But know what I do know, biblically? Humility is born in the presence of God. Because every time someone in the Bible gets in the presence of God, there's an act of humility. When Peter catches that huge catch a fish. Be away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. When Isaiah sees the Lord lifted up in the train of his robe filling the temple, he says, oh, woe is me as I am undone. The apostle John is in the presence of an angel and he's prostrating himself. But brothers and sisters, we need to be humble because Jesus is humble. And not only is Jesus humble, but Jesus is obedient. That's one of the ways we show our humility by saying, Lord, I'm not the master. You're the master. It's not my life, it's your life. I don't get to do whatever I want because it's my life. Lord, I was bought at a price. So Jesus was humbly obedient to the point of the cross. That's the crucifixion. And then verse, 
What it says in verse 9, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we had pre-incarnation, we had incarnation, then we had crucifixion, and now we have exaltation. Exaltation. And this teaches us that Jesus is universally praised. Jesus is universally praised. Now, I hope you notice the first word of verse 9. It's the word, therefore. And as you all well know, when you see the word, therefore, what do you say? What's it there for? There it is. I saved you about $40,000 at seminary. One word. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking seminary. You should all go. But therefore is a conclusion word. When you see the word therefore, you say, what's it there for? Because Jesus pre-incarnation was God's equal. Because in the incarnation, Jesus became a servant. At the crucifixion, Jesus was humbly obedient. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. If you like adjectives, highly exalted could be translated super exalted. I like that word. Super exalted. Uber exalted. Why does everyone laugh when you say the word uber? It's because it sounds like goober, right? That's what it is. We're all like little kids at heart. Brothers and sisters, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. Because Jesus is all these things, God has exalted him. And he's given him a name above every name. What does every mean? Every. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. What does every mean? Every. And every tongue will confess. What does every mean? Every. That's why I say Jesus is universally praised. Because in the end of the day, when it's all said and done, when everybody, when this is over and everybody sees Jesus for who he really is, every single person who has ever lived from every generation, every tribe, tongue, for all of humanity, every single person is going to bow their knee to Jesus in homage. Everybody is. And every single tongue no matter what the language is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I love it. It says in heaven, on earth, and those under the earth, the angelic realm, all the spiritual realm, and all those who have been glorified, everybody who's alive and everybody who's already passed on. Universal. Now, I ask you this. If Jesus is going to be confessed and every knee is going to bow, ultimately, then why not start doing it now? Because that's what we were created to do. See, listen, if you're in here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, at some point you will. But when you do it on that day, it's going to be too late. You're going to acknowledge it and you're going to be under punishment because you did not receive God's grace. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like it at all. If it was up to me, everyone going to heaven because only sick people want people to go to hell. But you know what? I don't make those rules. Ultimately, everybody, hear me clearly, all of you, in this room, online, anywhere, every person of all time is going to ultimately confess that Jesus is the Lord, that he is God, that he came to die to forgive you. You will ultimately say it. It's just a matter, do you say it now unto salvation, or do you say it later unto judgment? And if that reality is true, if that reality is true, then let's get the decision right because a no decision on that day will be a no decision. So we need to make that decision. Finally, Jesus is God. We respond. Jesus is God. And then we respond. You and I respond. For some of us in a moment, You're going to respond to Jesus for the first time. For for the first time here today, you are going to confess that Jesus is Lord. You're going to say, I'm bowing my knee right now. Before I do it later, I'm going to do it right now. And I'm going to receive a new life. 
I'm going to receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to receive the forgiveness of my sins and the possibility of living the life that I've always dreamed of empowered by the Holy Spirit. For others of us, you're here today and you believe in Jesus, but you've kind of gotten far. Like the Apostle Peter, you've kind of strayed away a little bit. You're following Jesus at a distance and you're involved in all sorts of things that you know you ought not to be involved in. You're going to respond to Jesus by saying you're sorry and coming back to him today. That's right. You're going to respond to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've gotten a little far away. I want to get back close with you. And then, you know, others of us, maybe you're walking real strong with the Lord. Maybe you're saying, look, this is the best season in my Christian life than I've ever had. I mean, I just feel God's presence. I feel empowered by the Holy Spirit. Guess what? We need to respond to Jesus as well. Why? Because yesterday's man is not going to sustain us today. God has a whole new set of things in front of us today. And we respond to Jesus, who is God, by simply saying, Lord, okay, what are we going to do today? What do you got going on, Lord, today? I'm game. But brother, sister, no matter where you are today, on that spectrum, I believe God wants all of us to respond to him today, afresh each one of us simply responding to Jesus, who is God. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is God. We confess it. He is God. We thank you that he came and that he's real. And that, Lord, before he was a baby in the manger, he was equal with you. And then he became a child and, and took on that form of a voluntary servant. And then he was obedient and humble and took the cross. And Lord, and you have exalted him, super exalted him. And we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of every generation that Jesus is Lord to your glory. And Father, we want to respond to Jesus today, right now. Each one of us, right where we are. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there is no doubt many in here today who you're here today and you're, gonna, you're making that decision for Jesus for the very first time that that decision just begins the process. But every process begins somewhere. And everything that's been going on in your life, you're here today, maybe you're watching online or one of our other venues, and you're just saying to yourself, I need to make that decision today. I know that I'm going to bow the knee to Jesus. I'm going to confess with my mouth. And I want to do it today. And I want to start that today. I want a new life. I want my sins forgiven. I want the Holy Spirit to be in me and working through my life. I want, a, I want my life to be changed. I want a humble life. We know that humility begins simply with saying yes to Jesus. So if that's you, if you're in here today and you're making those decisions for the first time, we're going to take a few steps of faith together here. The very first step is simply just saying yes to Jesus. So if that's you and you want to make a decision to start following Jesus today, I just want you to raise your hand. Just say yes to Jesus. Raise him up high. I see you right here in the front. God bless you. I see you right there in, my, in the third or fourth row. Keep those hands up high. It's a big room. You're saying yes to Jesus in here today. 